Hello everyone, I am the Tranquil Feline and I hope you're ready to learn because today I come bearing the gift of knowledge. More specifically, in this banner lord guide I'll be giving you a blueprint for maximizing your trade skill and obtaining the final perk which is named Everything Has a Price. If you are one of the few people who still don't know what this perk can do, allow me to give you the basics. In a nutshell, EHAP allows you to trade cities and citadels with the upper echelons of Caradian society, and in my opinion, this ability is an absolute game changer. Or at least it would have been if everything worked as advertised. Unfortunately, the lords of Calradia are too poor to actually pay full price for the real estate you're selling, and they value their own fiefs far too much, to the point where one of your towns isn't even worth one of their castles. But despite these problems, this perk is still pretty good, and it is my responsibility to teach you how to obtain it as efficiently as possible without using exploits. I gotta warn you though, my method involves at least 15 hours of grinding, whereas the exploit only takes 20 minutes. So if you'd rather do that, I put a link in the description to someone who teaches you how to cut corners better than I ever could. But the exploit is certainly going to get patched sooner or later and when that happens, my method will still work. Or will it? Probably not, since it relies upon the very same trading mechanics that allow the exploit to exist. Oh well, maybe this technique will no longer be valid in the future, depending on how the patch is handled, but even so, you're bound to learn something, or at the very least, enjoy the tales of a psychopathic merchant as he attempts to achieve apotheosis. Thing is, in order to understand my galaxy brain method, you need to already be familiar with many of this game's intricate mechanics. You must know the basics of the Calradian economic system, then you must learn about the best methods of trading goods across the continent so you can develop your skill to an acceptable level, then you need to know about war, rebellions, strategy and battle tactics, sieges, kingdom creation and management, army formation and diplomacy, and so on and so on. Basically, this trading technique I'm about to share with you is the culmination of a long and elaborate and arduous campaign which involves you engaging with all of those systems. Because they are all intertwined with one another and if you fail at one of them, the entire house of cards collapses. So if you're new at this game and don't have a solid grasp on all of those mechanics, you probably won't understand much and I'm sorry to say but I can't help with that. Not today, because going into detail about all this stuff would take 5 hours and nobody wants that. I'll still give you some brief explanations about whatever is immediately relevant to today's subject, and I hope that is enough to set you on the right path. If it isn't, just ask your questions in the comment section and I'll try to provide an answer. Boy, that was the intro. A bit longer than I would have liked, but necessary. We can't just jump into such a complex subject before knowing what's ahead of us. With all that out of the way, let us discuss the most ruthless technique for developing your trade skill, which from now on will be referred to as Siege Trading 2.0. As the name implies, this is the second iteration of a tactic I've already shared more than a year ago. To repeat what I've said back then, siege trading involves you stockpiling a ton of food and other trade goods, then waiting for a siege to occur. Once that happens, you must ride towards the city that's being attacked and when the siege is lifted, you will be the first to walk through the gates of this town with a wagon full of goodies that the locals are willing to pay top dollar for. And because of the increased markup, your humongous profits would contribute a lot of experience to your trade skill and until recently, this was a viable tactic of obtaining the final perk. Unfortunately, in the current political climate of Calradia, a town is rarely besieged. It's even more uncommon for a siege to last long enough to have an actual impact on the local economy, so the only alternative you have is to do it yourself. But attacking a city all by your lonesome is impossible because as soon as the maesters send the ravens that call their liege lords for help, you have a week at most to either take the town or fuck off. 
neither of which are acceptable options because you need the siege to last for a very long time. So before you can even attempt this, there's a checklist of prerequisites you must fulfill, but instead of looking at it that way, let's try to approach this subject as if it were a puzzle. The first step is to identify the puzzle pieces and once they're all laid out in front of you, we'll see exactly how the entire plan comes together. Puzzle piece number one is reaching a trade level of 275 through conventional means because siege trading isn't something you can do consistently. As a matter of fact, this technique can only be used once or twice throughout your entire campaign, as it's only meant to save you the painful grind of the last 25 levels or so, because obtaining those is almost as difficult as getting the first 250. But how do you get the first 275 trade levels? Well, that's up to you. Perhaps my previous trade guides can prove themselves useful, even though they're no longer 100% up to date. And if my videos can help you, search for someone else's content or wait for me to make an updated trade guide or better yet, trust in your own merchant instinct. Just do it! And consider taking these perks as well, because having your trade penalty reduced leads to bigger profits, and bigger profit leads to faster skill development. Oh, and this should go without saying, but if you want to maximize your trade level, you need to put 5 focus points into the skill, and the social attribute has to be at least 9 out of 10. Alright, so, trade 275, or at the very least 250, is prerequisite number 1. Prerequisite number 2 is to reach Clan Tier 4. Usually, you need to fight a lot of enemies to get the renown necessary to get there, but thanks to this perk in the trade skill, you can passively increase your renown by just investing into workshops. While you're busy doing your trade runs, your businesses will make you famous. And if you'd like to speed up that process, you can join one of the major factions as a mercenary and attack the enemy's villages or even fight their lords for a steady stream of renown. But if you go down this road, make sure you build your workshops and cities belonging to the faction you just joined, otherwise they'll get seized by the enemy when war is declared. While you work towards fulfilling those two requirements, there's a third one you must try to accomplish. Getting 1 million gold coins into your piggy bank. I don't give a fuck how you achieve this. Through trade or smithing or mercenary contracts or raiding enemy caravans, or even attacking lords and selling the gear of their fallen soldiers on the black market. 1 million dinars plus the spring of gold perk equals 1000 dinars per day as passive income, which you will need later on. Because siege trading is going to cost you a lot of money, so you need to secure a rainy day fund for when the time comes. If you know what you're doing, it'll be a breeze to get a million. If you don't, check out my raider guides for some tips, or wait for my next build guide, which I will call the Rogue Trader. By the way, this video was supposed to be just a single topic of that build guide, but seeing how massive it was going to be, I decided to split it up into multiple parts. Links to those videos will be placed in the description whenever they're finished. Oh, and before the build guide is published, I'll have to put it to the test during a series of live streams, so stay tuned if that's something you'd like to witness. But I digress. So, with your trade skill at level 270, your clan at tier 4, and a million pennies in the pension fund, you are ready for prerequisite number 4, preparing an army. Notice how I've said preparing and not assembling, because you can't assemble an army unless you're a king, and in order to be king you will need a castle, which is prerequisite number 5 by the way. But let's stay in the present. How do you prepare an army? Before I answer that, let me ask you a question. What kind of soldiers do you want marching by your side? Infantry? Crossbowmen? Horse archers? Because mobility is kind of important, I will assume you want a lot of cavalry, in which case, the Kuzeyets will provide you with soldiers, willingly or otherwise. Now, there's two ways for you to do this. If you want to do it peacefully, complete some quests in Kuzeyet territory, become a pillar of the local community, and the notable landlords will happily supply you with troops, even more so if you joined their faction as a mercenary. But if you're in a hurry and don't have time to make friends, there is an alternative, high-risk, high-reward method to fill your party with a lot of fighters. Forced conscription. 
The smart way to do this is to check the Wikipedia entry of the faction whose soldiers you're trying to conscript, in my case the Kuzeyats, and if they're at war with another faction, join their enemies as a mercenary. Once you do, pay a visit to each of the enemy villages, take a hostile action and force the notables to give you recruits. If you also have the perk that allows people to see you in best light, you can get up to 15 proper soldiers from each settlement you attack, making this the best method to fill your party with elite warriors. But if the Kuzeyats are not at war with anybody and you still choose to go down the conscription route, you could do something incredibly stupid and declare war on them yourself. However, you can't formally declare your hostilities because the diplomacy page is only available after you join or create a kingdom, so you'll have to do this the old-fashioned way. Attack them without warning. It doesn't matter whether you assault their peasants or rob one of their caravans or start raiding a village, as long as you do something nasty to them, a war will be provoked and you'll be free to go on a conscription spree. After your party is full, it is time to go to the clan menu and assign one of your trusted companions to lead a party of his own. Give him as many men as he can manage, then recruit some more and repeat this process until you have three companions leading a full-sized warband each and your own party is filled to the max. Do make sure that your soldiers aren't just tier 1 morons, otherwise you're going to have a bad time. With four full parties standing ready to be assembled into an army, you have completed the fourth requirement and can now get ready for prerequisite number five, obtaining a castle. So if you were a mercenary for one of the major factions, it is time to hand them your resignation letter and go look for a castle that has a lower number of men defending it than you do in your own warband. If you somehow find a city that meets this criteria, that's even better, but a castle is all we need for now. And once you've found an appropriate target, declare war on the faction who owns it by using the aforementioned methods and then lay siege to this fort. When you do, build a ram, a siege tower, maybe a catapult if you can, but try to launch your assault before the enemy lords arrive to its defense. When you inevitably succeed and the castle is yours, assign one of your companions as a governor and have a chat with him or her and then proclaim yourself king. Or sultan or emperor or pharaoh, I don't judge. Depending on the culture of your kingdom, you will get some random bullshit policies which you may keep or abolish, I don't care. What matters is that once you've crowned yourself king, which is the end goal of prerequisite number 5, is to unlock the following policies. Sacred Majesty, Royal Guard, and then Noble Retinues, in that order. Try to get this done as soon as you have the 100 influence needed to enact each of these policies. Once you become the ruler of your own faction, you will have earned the privilege of calling the clan patrols you have prepared into a huge army. You're going to need it in order to perform the siege trading technique. In the meantime, make sure that your new castle is garrisoned by a skeleton crew of about 50 men, just in case you want to use it for nefarious purposes. Without going into details, you can basically use this castle as bait for smaller enemy armies to attack it, and once they do, you can strike at them with your hopefully much bigger army. I personally don't want to bother with that, so as soon as I declare myself king, the castle loses all its value, and I take all the soldiers out of its garrison and then leave this fief to its fate. And in addition to rallying your banners into a proper army, once you become royalty you'll also be able to recruit more people into your own party. The title of king adds 20 extra men, the royal guard policy allows you to recruit another 60, and once your clan is tier 5, the Noble Retinues policy will enable you to field 40 more soldiers. With all my other perks and skill bonuses, my party size can accommodate 354 people and together with my three companions, we can field an army of 600 and nice. Those numbers can vary depending on different factors, but if you can lead at least 300 men into battle, that's more than enough to successfully besiege a town. But we aren't quite there yet because you cannot do siege trading until you have items to trade. Which leads us to puzzle piece number 6. 
the stockpiling stage. This step requires you to travel the world with your gargantuan army and pass through every town and village in your path. If they sell cheap wares, you will buy them. If some of the cities you pass through offer three times more money than what you paid for some of the items in your inventory, you can feel free to sell a few of them, but the main goal of this stage is to stockpile a humongous amount of wares. And the reason you're using an army and not doing this with just your party is because the more people you have, the more horses you can herd and the more cargo you can carry. To give a proper example, here's how my inventory looked like just before I initiated the siege trading. Important note about all this stuff. Because I had very little amounts of beer, butter, cheese and meat, they were eventually consumed by my men by the time the siege came to an end, so I never got to profit from them. On the other hand, the 6000 sacks of grain, 1000 units of fish, 700 grapes as well as the fur, iron, tools and other non-edible items, that's what actually brought me a huge profit and allowed me to max out my trade level. You'll see how when we get there. For now, let us build the stockpile. One last piece of advice I have to offer in regards to this stage is that before you purchase stuff from a city, you first pay a visit to its bound villages and buy whatever they're selling because it's going to be a lot cheaper for you in the long run, especially if you've unlocked this perk. How is it cheaper if the village sells fish for 9 dinars a piece and the city sells it for 8? I'm glad you asked. You see, when you purchase fish from a village with 9 gold per unit, that price remains constant, even as you deplete their entire supply. But when you go into the city, the starting price may be 8 dinars, but it will gradually increase as the local supply decreases, because the town merchants can afford to hire an accountant who adjusts the price accordingly, whereas in the village, an accountant is a luxury the peasantry cannot afford. And if the cost of a certain item increases in town, it will also increase in the surrounding bound villages. So to repeat myself, you first buy stuff from villages, then from the town, then you move on to the next fiefdom and repeat this process over and over until you've hoarded an enormous amount of mules, horses, food and other trade goods. I have to warn you, however, traveling with your army all over the world is going to be slow and painful and it can take an entire hour until you've built your stockpile. But it is my firm belief that this one hour of work will help you skip 10 hours of grinding trade levels through conventional means. You know, probably. I never had to earn those levels through monotonous trading. It could have taken 10 hours or 5 hours or it could have taken just a couple of hours, in which case, the joke's on me for going through this overly elaborate method instead of doing it the old-fashioned way. While you're at it, prerequisite number 7 is to amass a decent amount of weapons and armor and you can get this done at any point throughout your journey, preferably before you begin your siege trading attempt. It doesn't even matter whether you take this gear from bandits or fallen soldiers or if you straight up purchase it from another town. What matters is to gather some spare equipment, I'll tell you why when we get there. But the reason you've built such a huge stockpile is so you can sell it for exorbitant prices. However, the only way to get there is by destroying a city's entire economy. And the best way of doing that is by keeping it under siege and starving out the inhabitants for an entire month, if not more. But as I've said in the beginning, that is a bit of a problem, because if you try to take a town from one of the major factions, they will send armies of thousands to break your siege. And even though you may be the most brilliant strategic mastermind who has ever walked the earth, there's no way you can defeat all those armies with just your 300 men. Not even Leonidas could do it. So how do we get around that problem? By attacking someone other than the major factions. You see, every once in a while the common folk will have had enough of the nobility's shit and they will revolt against their tyrannical overlords. And when a city goes rebel, it secedes from one of the major kingdoms as the townsfolk establish their own independent faction which is no longer under the protection of the nobility. And instead of being defended by dozens of lords who will all ride out to break your siege with their tens of thousands of soldiers, 
The area will only be patrolled by three Malakas whose combined forces cannot hope to match your army, therefore giving you free reign to keep the city under siege for as long as you need to. To boil it down to the essential salts, you cannot perform siege training in a town that's owned by the major factions, because you cannot keep it under siege long enough to wreck its economy. Instead, you will do this to a rebel town that isn't protected by an already established kingdom. Now. Cities may sometimes rebel on their own, and if something of the sort happens as soon as you're done with prerequisites 6 and 7, you're in luck. Go there immediately and do your job, but more often than not, if a city rebels, it won't do so when it's convenient to you, and by the time you're done with all 7 prerequisites, the faction they rebelled against might have already gathered a proper army and took back their town, so waiting is not the most viable strategy. Sometimes you have to take matters into your own hands, just like my love life, because you see, rebellion is like gravity. All it takes is a little push. And that's basically the end goal of prerequisite number 8, destabilization. Most prerequisites thus far were mere steps, but destabilization, which is the final piece of our puzzle, is so complicated that it will need a few steps of its own. The first step is to pay attention to the loyalty of cities you pass through. Usually, this loyalty stat is pretty damn high, unless the town has recently been conquered by another faction. As an example, in my current playthrough, Tial is owned by the Kuzeyats, but the town's original culture is Sturgian. As such, the locals aren't very fond of that, because nobody in their right mind wants to be ruled by foreign invaders, and as a result, the loyalty of this town is going to be lower than average. Perfect for what we're trying to accomplish. The next step after identifying a suitable target is to go to the market and purchase most of its food, especially if it's plentiful and cheap. You don't have to take all of it away, just take most of it and the siege will do the rest. The third step is to declare war on the faction that owns this town, this time from the diplomacy interface and optionally raid the town's bound villages. This in turn will decrease its food supply for the foreseeable future, as well as having a negative impact on its security, which will negatively affect the town's loyalty. But this effect isn't that great, which is why the village raids are optional. Step number four is to lay siege to this town. This is why you built such a huge army after all. Well, this and the ability to carry more horses and cargo during the stockpiling phase. During the setup stage of this siege, build yourself a battering ram, a siege tower if you want to, maybe even a catapult and some trebuchets if the enemy takes too long to respond. But once they get close, you'd do best to launch the assault and uh, conquer the town. I won't tell you how to win the siege, as that would be too long of a detour to take from the main subject, so I will assume you know how to shoot people with a crossbow, or order your men to do it in your stead. Once the town has fallen to your troops, devastate it. This will have a huge impact on the town's loyalty, decreasing it by a whopping 30. Of course, that is their loyalty towards you, not to the people you liberated the city from, but that resentment will transfer over to the Kuzeyats, should they decide to retake this city. Luckily for you, that's exactly what you want them to do. But after conquering the town, you might have bigger problems to worry about, such as the huge enemy army waiting outside the city, so if you find yourself surrounded by a force you cannot defeat in an open field, Wait in town until one of the following two things happens. Option number one, the enemy walks away because even though his army outnumbers your own, his soldiers cannot overcome the defenses of your city without reinforcements. So if they make themselves scarce, you can simply walk out of town and leave the premises. Or option number two, the enemy has enough warriors to lay siege to your town, in which case you will have to sacrifice a portion of your men to make your escape. Whatever the case, you will have to empty this town's garrison because you don't want the locals to feel secure and when you do, leave or make your escape, depending on the circumstances, and find yourself something else to do until this town is taken back by its former owners. Don't stray too far because you need to be ready to jump into action as soon as that happens. You saw, you conquered, you left. What now? 
Now you wait for the enemy to reclaim this city because you don't want the local population to revolt against you. If they do, they miraculously conjure an infinite amount of food in their storage room and that defeats the entire purpose of siege trading. This is most likely a bug because I cannot explain how else they get enough food to keep themselves fed for all eternity in the one second it took for the town to go rebel. I mean, one moment they're starving and the next they're feasting? How does that make any sense? Anyway, because of this bug or intentional feature, you're going to want the people to rebel against the other faction because when that happens, the revolutionaries do not gain magical powers and therefore, their food supply is exactly how it should be very limited. So for the third time, if the other faction manages to take this city from you, that is perfect. If the town's loyalty was low after your devastation, then it will be even lower after the reclamation and the rebellion may be brewing. To verify that, walk through its bound villages and if they've recovered from your raids, or if you've never raided them in the first place, you may see that there's talk about rebels in the countryside, in which case, the revolution is assured. Hell, you can even make peace with a kingdom you've just attacked, or sneak into the town and see its exact loyalty stat, and if it's below 10, then a deadly insurrection is almost guaranteed to happen within a week. Whatever the case, don't stray too far, because if the town rebels and you're not there to attack it yourself, the other faction certainly will, so find yourself something to pass the time while you wait for the townsfolk to declare their independence. When that finally happens... If you haven't already, make peace with the enemy kingdom, even if you have to pay them a huge tribute, because during the actual siege, you can afford no interruptions of any kind. And with all those prerequisites out of the way, it is finally time for siege trading to commence. But before we talk about it, we have to recap all the steps you needed to take in order to get here. Step number one, trade until your skill is level 275, or at the very least, 250. That's actually a lot of steps that can take you several in-game years, so make sure you also train other skills in the meantime, preferably combat skills, steward, leadership and maybe even roguery. Step number two is to develop your clan to tier 4, which can be achieved passively while you're busy making progress towards prerequisite number one. Step number three is to get a million dinars, and you will work towards this in parallel with the first two prerequisites. Step number four involves preparing some additional clan parties, for which you will need a lot of companions by the way, after which you will want to move on to step number five, taking a castle, crowning yourself king and unlocking the ability to assemble an entire army with your three other clanmates. Step number six is to use your army as a titanic trade convoy, whose entire purpose is stockpiling an unbelievable amount of resources and horses, which you are going to sell for an exceedingly high profit. At the same time, you should also gather a decent amount of weapons and armors. This is best done when you're at war with the faction you stole the castle from during step number 5, but it can be done at any time throughout your journey. That's step number 7 by the way, and step number 8 is to destabilize a town or wait until it gets taken over by a rebel faction. A faction that cannot possibly send armies of thousands in an attempt to stop you from taking their city. And now that everything is set up, I have but a small favor to ask. If you think this video is mediocre, you don't have to do anything. If, however, you've found it helpful or entertaining or you simply appreciate my efforts, click the like button and help me beat the algorithm. Anyway, so the town had its little revolution, you made peace with all the other nations in Calradia, and then you paid a visit to its market. If somehow they sell cheap food, buy it for yourself. Soon as you're done with that, declare a war on the rebels by raiding one of their villages and immediately abandoning the raid. Because they're not a real faction, you cannot do this from the diplomacy page. Also, do yourself a favor and open the inventory so you can take a look at the current prices of the items, just to have a reference point. And with all that taken care of, the siege trading can begin. All you have to do at this stage is to order the construction of four trebuchets, recall the first three into storage as soon as they're built, and once the fourth one is finished, deploy the others so that you'll have four engines of war firing at the same time. During the bombardment stage, you will take some casualties, so recall your trebuchets as soon as both walls have been breached. 
After that, all you gotta do is keep the siege going and watch the enemy's food stocks deplete. And as soon as they reach zero, you'll notice the number of defenders dwindle and slowly wither away. I like to call this the famine stage because your only goal during this part of the siege is to starve out the inhabitants and completely obliterate their economy. And since nobody will be able to interrupt you for the foreseeable future, you should be able to keep this going for at least a month, but you can take longer if you want to. Just make sure to open your inventory every once in a while and watch the prices of your items steadily increase for each day that the town is not supplied with uh, anything because nobody can walk in or out due to your blockade. No caravans, no villagers, no Davos Seaworth smuggling onions and saving the townsmen from the tummy ache you're subjecting them to. But this is going to be very costly for you. Remember when I told you to scrounge up a million dinars and call that your rainy day fund? Well, that is inaccurate because it's more of a rainy month during which you produce nothing. You don't trade, you don't raid, you don't attack anyone or do anything that earns you money besides waiting for the local economy to collapse. And while you're waiting, your entire army will require their wages paid on a daily basis. The prices may vary, but you may end up having to pay 5,000 dinars per day, which can be offset by the passive income earned by your workshops, caravans and the Spring of Gold perk. Anyway, to repeat myself, you want to keep this going for as long as you possibly can and open your inventory once every few days to check on the prices of your items. When grain surpasses 90 dinars per unit, it might be a good time to bring this siege to an end, but if you can afford it, you could keep at it for a few more days and see just how high these prices can go. For me, grain capped at 97 dinars per unit, but with the right perks, you could probably get it to surpass 100. Anyway, when prices stop increasing, if there's still defenders inside, send your men to neutralize them and bring the siege to an end. And with that, the city is conquered and the siege part is finally done. I advise that you show the town mercy this time and as soon as your banner hangs over its walls, pay a visit to the market. If everything went according to plan, the goods section should be empty and you will see some ridiculous markups for all the trade goods and horses in your inventory. In my example, iron is 64% more expensive than average. Leather sells for 161% more. Fur has a 267% price increase. Linen, 370%. Hides, 543. Fish is 866% more expensive and grain has a markup of 870%. And since I only paid 7 dinars per unit of grain, that's 90 dinars profit for each unit sold. Multiply that by 6,000, which is the number of units I stockpiled, and we end up with almost half a million dinars of pure profit. And that's just the grain. We haven't taken any of the other items into account. But, uh, what's this? I sold 4 sacks of grain and the price dropped to 93. Then I sold one more and it dropped to 89 then to 85, then to 81, and by the time I sold 10 units, the price already dropped to 73? No, this cannot be, because by the time I sell 500 units, the price drops to 9, which is roughly what I paid for it, and it's no longer profitable. Where are the profits I was promised? This is what you may be thinking if you're doing regular siege trading. But remember, this is Siege Trading 2.0. And it has another component that I haven't yet talked about, and I haven't even hinted at. Before we discuss that component, however, let's take another reality check. Even if the prices were fixed, you still wouldn't make a whole lot of profit in this town. Because it only has about 50,000 dinars available, and you're supposed to earn 10 times that amount from the grain alone. No, we need more money than the town could ever provide. Which brings us to the most important component of our new and improved siege trading technique. And this component is scamming because as soon as the siege is lifted, caravans from all over the continent will flock to this town like flies to a pile of dung. Why do they do that? They come to take the profits you've set up for yourself. But when they walk through the gates of this city, they can't sell anything because the townsfolk are flat broke and don't even have anything to barter. Why is that? 
Remember when we were talking about prerequisite number 7? Stockpile equipment. Just do it, I'll tell you why when we get there. Well, here we are. So now that you've put together a big pile of weapons and armor, you will sell it into this town. Not because you need their money, but because you want them to have nothing to offer to the incoming caravans. And I mean absolutely nothing. You gotta go full OCD in order to get this to work, but uh, we skipped a few steps. So let's go back to the moment you just captured the town and say everything in order. Otherwise, things will get confusing. So your siege succeeded, then you showed mercy to the town, walked in the market, got amazed by the wonderful prices of your items, and sold as much equipment as the town's merchants could afford. Now, you wait a little bit for caravans to arrive. While you wait, the locals are still starving because they cannot eat the weapons and armors you just sold them, and as such, the prices may continue to increase. And if any villagers come into town to supply it with food and other materials, you can't allow that to happen. So you'll have to intercept the peasants and buy everything from them, even if it costs tens of thousands. Then, keep waiting for caravans. When one is approaching the gates of your poor city, visit the market one more time and if the locals brought more money to the merchants, take it all by selling some equipment. This usually happens every morning, but I advise vigilance at all times. Then intercept the caravan, trade with it and sell your grain to the merchants. When you do, you will notice that they pay you 65 dinars per unit, whereas the city gives you 97. Well, you see, I call this the scamming stage because if you sell your grain to them for 65 and they sell it in town for 97, you got scammed, son. That's what you want the caravaneers to believe. That they're the ones scamming you and a huge profit awaits them in town. But when they walk in, nobody can afford to purchase that grain because you took all their money by selling them piece of shit armor and weapons. So the caravaneers will walk away with tails between their legs after they got scammed into paying 65 dinars per unit of grain. And the best part of it is, unlike the towns, caravans don't have accountants, which means the price remains fixed, even as I sell 140 sacks of wheat to them. Easy 9,000 dinars, 8,000 of which is raw profit, which greatly contributes to the development of our trade skill. Word of warning, when I've done this for the first time, I skipped prerequisite number 7, and because I needed to take all the money from the locals, I sold them my desert horses and mules. That actually had a negative impact on my siege trading attempt, because even though the caravaneers couldn't sell their wares for money, they could exchange them for extremely cheap horses, and that severely drove down the prices of all of my items. Even so, I got my trade skill to level 300 in one go, but with prerequisite number 7, you can be much more effective. To prove this point, I reloaded the save game I made prior to the siege, bought some weapons and then gave it another try. On my second attempt, I went up to level 318, which is impressive when you consider the fact that the more you surpass your learning limit, the slower you train your skill. And if you notice that your prices started to decrease, you might want to get back into town and see if anyone managed to sneak in some trade goods. If they did, buy everything. You want the goods market to be completely empty. Anyway, after you scam the first caravan, you will wait for the next one to arrive and as soon as it does, you will repeat roughly the same steps. Step number one, check the town's market. Step number two, sell your equipment and take all the money, OCD style. Step number three, sell your desert horses to the caravan for a hyperinflated and fixed price. Then wait for the next caravan and sell your tools, and the next one to which you will sell your leather and hides, and the next 10 to which you will sell your fish, and the next 20 to which you'll sell your grain. I honestly lost count of how many caravans came into this town, but the point is, I traded with all of them and slowly but surely sold all of my items for an unbelievable amount of profit, which got me more trading experience in the span of 30 minutes than I would have gotten in several hours of regular trading. Basically, instead of roaming around the world doing global trading, I allowed the global trading to come to my doorstep. 
but if you think this is too tedious and you don't mind flushing 500,000 dinars down the drain, there's an even faster method. As soon as the siege is over, instead of waiting for caravans, head over to the nearest village that is bound to this town. The prices they offer for your goods should be the same as the caravans, lower than the towns, but fixed and again. If you don't mind robbing yourself of half a million because you're too lazy to talk to a hundred different caravans, you can instantly sell your entire inventory of trade goods to this settlement. The income from this village will slightly increase as the peasants sell your goods into the market and you will make about 20 grand from the whole ordeal instead of 500k but hey, at least you maximized your trade skill in an instant. And that's pretty much what I had to do in order to develop my trade skill to its absolute maximum after grinding the first 289 levels through conventional means. And with my trade skill maxed out, I could now unlock the perk that is aptly named Everything Has a Price, which enables me to trade castles and towns with the other nobles of Calradia. Is that a worthy ability to have? Is it worth investing that much time and effort into obtaining it? I cannot answer that question for you because it all depends on the individual. I personally enjoy having this perk, but if you feel like the grind is too much to handle, I won't blame you for saying fuck it and doing something else with your time. God knows there's plenty of ways to enjoy this game without buying real estate. If the barter system didn't have some major problems, I'd gladly recommend this perk, but the way things are right now, well, let's just say I've done my duty and taught you how to obtain it. Whether you actually use this knowledge is up to you. There are still some ways you can use this ability, but quite frankly, it would take another 15 minutes to explain all of them to you and this video is long enough already, so I think we're better off leaving this subject for another time. I do have one more thing to address before bringing this guide to an end. In the beginning I've said that I will teach you how to maximize your skill without using exploits, but now that I've described the actual method, it kinda sounds like it is an exploit. So is it? Well, it all depends on how you look at it. From a gameplay standpoint, uh, yeah, we've kind of exploited a bunch of caravans to skip the grind of regular trading and it doesn't make a whole lot of sense how those merchants let themselves be scammed. But when I judge game mechanics, I try to look at them from a perspective of if this virtual world followed the laws of physics and common sense, would my method still work? And from that perspective, I must ask you, does it make logical sense for someone to be considered a master trader after he has spent almost a decade moving pieces on a chessboard until they were ready to execute the biggest trade of the century? After all, this was a masterfully executed plan. One that required you to amass fortune and fame, engage in countless battles, conquer a castle, declare yourself an upstart king, assemble an army of at least 300 men, spend hundreds of thousands of dinars to stockpile a metric ton of trade goods, instigated a rebellion and then you destabilize the town over the course of several months to crash its economy, subjecting thousands of people to probably one of the worst famines that will ever exist on this continent. All that for just one sale. With all this considered, should all that effort be rewarded with a few levels in the trade skill? If you said yes, then my method is not an exploit. If your answer is no, then it is an exploit. As I've said, it's a matter of perspective. Anyway, as I've stated in the beginning, it is possible that a future patch will render this whole siege trading business obsolete depending on what changes are made to the trading system. If this happens, I have no better alternatives other than to trade as efficiently as possible. To help with that, I will be putting together an updated trading tutorial, but I don't know when it will be ready. Not anytime soon, I'll tell you that much. For the foreseeable future, I'll be working on my Rogue Trader build and Bandit's Ballads. Maybe I'll even find some time to stream in the meantime. But that's enough chit chat from me today. I have said everything I wanted to say. I've repeated several things more times than I should have. So it is time for us to part ways. Thank you lads for watching, subbing, liking and pressing a variety of other buttons. And I'll see you all next time. Goodbye for now.